Amen. Been preaching famous verses from the Bible. We're in the New Testament, and we'll be in the 14th chapter of St. John. We're going to read verse 1 through 6, and if you've ever been um, at a place where there was a gathering for a, uh, a time of, uh, of grief or sorrow, um, the preacher would use this verse many, many times, and it is an I- incredible verse. We're not to let our hearts be troubled. And so basically, Jesus is saying, stop it. Just stop it. God is real. Just stop it. God can take care of you. And basically, that's what Jesus is saying. So that concludes our sermon tonight. You may know. You wish, amen. (laughs) Chuck was about to go into a shock back there. Let's all stand for the reading of God's Word, chapter 14, St. John. We're going to read down to verse 6. Jesus is in the upper room. Um, In the upper room was the foot washing where Jesus washed the disciples' feet, chapter 13. Chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. And chapter 17 is the great prayer that Jesus prayed, glorify me from the, to the glory I once had from the beginning. And so we're looking, well, we're just in the upper room. Jesus is very grieved in the upper room. He's very troubled. In fact, in the 13th chapter, It says in verse 21 that Jesus was very troubled. It says when Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me this day. So Jesus was going through a a, a horrific time. You need to understand this. At the the time when Jesus was one of his lowest points, his, his lowest point, of course, was probably in the uh, wilderness of temptation and then in the Garden of Gethsemane. Those were his lowest points. But he was at a low point. He's getting ready to be crucified on the cross. And he was very troubled and very stirred. And the problem is, is the disciples really didn't get it. It was all about them. They were troubled. They were sorry. They wanted Jesus' comfort. And so Jesus gave the comfort that needed to be given because that's just the way our God is. He's a great God. And here's what he says to them after he told them he was going away. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I love those four words. I will come again. I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. And whether I go you know and the way you know. And Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest and how shall we know the way? And Jesus said unto him, I am am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I have a little different approach to this, and you need to understand real carefully because I want to talk about the day that Jesus disappeared. The day that Jesus disappeared. You may be seated. I know you're thinking, okay, yeah, This is a different approach. Jesus said in the last part of chapter 13 of St. John that he was going away. And he said to his disciples, where where I'm going, you cannot go. You can come later, but where I'm going, you cannot go. And Jesus tells them in that 13th chapter that he was going to go away, and, and that just dominated the disciples' heart because They couldn't understand, well, where are you going? He told them over and over again he was going to be crucified, die in Jerusalem. He was going to give his life uh, a ransom for sins. He told them over and over again that he was going to be betrayed and be crucified. But yet they seemed to not get it. 
They just didn't get it. And the truth is, they didn't get it until Jesus got up out of the grave. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, that would be the half-brother, James, the brother of Jesus, didn't get it until Jesus showed up after his resurrection, looked him up and said, Here I am, brother. I'm alive. And his brother James was converted at that moment. And he became the superintendent of the church. And he wrote the book of James, the brother of Jesus, half-brother of Jesus. And so I love how the Bible ties together. I love how it works together. And Jesus is very troubled. He washed the disciples' feet in chapter 13. He knows that this is his last meal. He's getting ready to go be executed. This is his last meal. He's going to be executed not for sins of his, but for the sins of the world. He's going to be crucified. And the Bible says that he was very troubled. And how many would agree the disciples surely picked up on that? Surely they would pick up, pick up on the fact in verse 21 of Matthew 13, or of John 13, rather, that Jesus was troubled. Surely they picked up on it. And, they, and he said, one of you shall betray me. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, we've been together for three and a half years. We've you know, we've eaten together, we've rejoiced together, we've cried together, we've laughed together, we've rejoiced together, but I'm leaving. And boy, did that really penetrate the worry heart. They were troubled because their master was going to leave. And they didn't quite understand the fact that he was going to go away. And uh, of course, Jesus Christ said, I'm going to go somewhere you can't go. And uh, later you can come, but as, as of now, you cannot go. If you want to back up to the 13th chapter of St. John, verse 33, we'll read the rest of this chapter 13 of St. John. And he said, little children, yet a little while I am with you. In other words, I'm going to be with you just for a little bit. You shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. So now I say unto you, a new commandment I give unto you, that you should love one another as I have loved you, that ye, shall, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love, love one to another. And Jesus was basically telling his disciples here, you're going to need a whole lot of love. I'm going to disappear. I'm going to die on the cross and you're going to need a whole lot of love. You're going to have to love each other. You're going to have to care for each other. And one of the things that's going to identify you as my disciples is that you'll have love one for another. It's amazing how Jesus commanded us to love each other. He said, well, why would he command us to love each other? Because we're just not that stinking lovable. That's why. Hello? We needed that commandment. You ever met folks that's not very lovable? Thank God for the commandment. I've got to love you. I've got to love you. I've got to love you. Amen. And, but I don't have to like you. Hello. I've got to love you, but I don't have to like it. <laughs> uh, don't laugh. Don't look at me like, well, preacher, I think you're missing it there. Do you have someone that you don't like, but you do love them? Anybody? That's a paradox. Anybody got someone you don't like a whole lot, but you know that you've got to love them? Amen. Hello. That dinosaur movie years ago, uh, I can't remember the dinosaur family, the little baby said, gotta love me, I'm the baby. I'm the baby, gotta love me. Now some of you ain't got a clue what I'm talking about. But notice he says, you have love for another, one for another, you're gonna need this love. And Simon said unto him, Lord, verse 36, whither goest thou? And Jesus answered, whether I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. And Peter said unto him, Lord, why can't not I follow thee now? Now, 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 now. And Jesus said, you can't follow me now. I will lay down my life, Peter says, for you. And the Lord says, now, Peter, it, it's bad to be rebuked in front of your friends, but it's worse when Jesus is rebuking you. And Jesus answered and said, 
Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, I say unto you, the cock shall not crow till you have denied me thrice. Wow. Another place he says, the, the cock shall not crow twice before you deny me thrice. How I many of roosters crow early toward morning? And all I got to say is Peter better be thankful that he didn't have Judy's rooster because he crows all the time. Day and night. And, and I'm about convinced the shotgun is probably the only thing that can take the crow out of him. But then again, I've got to live with my wife. I wouldn't kill the rooster. No, sir. I get some earplugs. Amen. But anyway, I, I want you to understand that Jesus Christ is telling his disciples, your heart is going to be literally broken. I'm going to disappear. I'm be gone. The day that Jesus became invisible, the day that he disappeared. Now we know that Jesus says to them, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Now I want you to understand when you read that, it's comforting. It's powerful. Amen. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'd go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Wow. What comfort. What powerful words coming from Jesus Christ. But I want you to understand where he says, if you, he said, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Ye believe in God. Here's what he's trying to say to them, and we miss this. He's trying to say to them, you believe in God, you have believed in God before I came along. You believed in God when he was invisible. You believed in God when he was invisible. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. He said, I too am going to be invisible. I'm going away. And I want you with the same faith and the same desire that you do had for God during the temple and during you know, the worship of God, I want you to believe me just like you believed God before I showed up. Jesus Christ, it says in John chapter 1 that the, that the Word was made flesh, verse 14, and dwell among us. That's when Jesus became visible to us. Well, to them they, then. Now he's invisible to us now. But to the disciples, he became visible because the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus walked with his disciples and they loved each other. They walked in the grace of God. And Jesus says, I'm going to go away. I'm going to go where you can't go. What was he talking about? He was talking about he's going to the cross and he's going to... He's going to die for the sins of the world. He's going to provide the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of the world. And Peter, you can't do that. And James and John, you can't do that. And you and I in this auditorium, we can't do that. Because Jesus is the way, the life, and the truth. And only Jesus Christ can do this. So Jesus Christ says, I'm going away, and I'm going to go where you can't go. I'm going to die on the cross of Calvary. Oh, you'll come later, and you'll die later, and then you'll be going to the, into the Father's house. But it's not going to happen until I go to the cross and prepare a place for you, that I must go to that cross. See, there's two places here. Uh, Jesus Christ provided us a place in the Father's heart. He provided us a place of forgiveness, a place of mercy. If you, if you will, he provided us a happy meal. He gave us a place. He provided us a place. And aren't you glad in this world you got a place? You know, we sing, this world's not my home, I'm just passing through. And that's true. We are just passing through. But we've got a house, but it's not home. As a Christian, we have a home in heaven. We have a home that Jesus Christ has provided for us. We have a place, an altar that the world does not have. We have a, a place to roll out our burdens on the back of Jesus Christ that the world is not experiencing, that is not participating. We have an altar 
that the world has no right to partake of. Jesus Christ has come to bring us eternal life, and we can roll our burdens on Jesus Christ. Listen, if you think you're going to go to heaven because you go to church, you think you're going to go to heaven because you read your Bible, you think you're going to go to heaven because you do this, you get baptized a certain way, you do a certain thing because it works, the truth is, uh, if you believe that, then the burden is on you to go to heaven. But thank God Jesus Christ, His Father, our Father God, Put the burden on Jesus Christ, not on us. I don't have the burden to make heaven my home. Jesus Christ took the burden and he made heaven my home through his shed blood and his resurrection. Amen. Come on now. You're not, you're not shouting and praising God, but that's a great truth. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Yes, you believe in God. You believe in God and he's invisible. And Jesus Christ is saying, I'm getting ready to go where you can't go. And he did. He went to the cross of Calvary. He prepared a place for us. When he shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, he died. He was mutilated. He was beaten uh, beyond recognition. Up on that cross, the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of the world. He bowed his head, died, and yielded his spirit and his soul into the presence of God and commanded his, his life to uh, ascend to God into the hands of God and there his body put in a tomb and he disappeared. He disappeared. Now he reappeared three days and three nights later because he rose again from the grave. Amen? I want you to see something that's really interesting. Uh, when um, Samuel, prophet Samuel, that great first prophet. And the children of Israel whined and said, we want a king like all the other nations. And Samuel was so mad and so distraught because they wanted a king like all the other nations. And God said to Samuel, they've not rejected you. They've rejected me. And so Jesus Christ gave them a king. Saul and then David, and then so on. But now, God says, I'm going to give you a king. And when Jesus Christ come to earth, the wise man says, where is he born king of the Jews? And so Jesus came to give us a king. And the king materialized on earth. God in flesh. He died on the cross of Calvary, conquered death, hell, and the grave, and became King of kings and Lord of lords. Isn't that beautiful? I, uh, when you think about the Father's house, you think, well, that's heaven. Let me explain some things. I, I wrote down some things about heaven. When you think of heaven, um, you think, well, heaven is called. What is heaven called? Well, here the Father's house. But the problem is, in the second chapter of St. John, the Father's house, Jesus Christ said, make not my Father's house a place of merchandise. Uh, you made it a den of thieves. And so the temple was called the Father's house. Jesus Christ said, uh, you've made my Father's house a den of thieves. Now, what, do you, you, what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this. The house in Jerusalem the Father's house, Jesus called it the Father's house, was only a copy of what is in heaven. It was a copy. And because it was a copy, how many know copies get messed up? How many would agree that a copy can really get distorted? And this copy of supposed to be the Father's house got distorted. It got filled with a bunch of embezzling and th thievery and wickedness. And so uh, it was a place of a lack of prayer. And Jesus Christ came in in the beginning of his ministry and he cleaned up the house of God. He cleaned up his father's house. And then at the end of his ministry, he came back in and cleaned it up again. And he, and he pronounced judgment upon the house of God. In fact, the copy was so mistreated um, and so defiled that Jesus Christ says, well, this copy is going to be destroyed. This copy is going to be destroyed. And in 70 AD, God allowed the
the copy to be literally destroyed. But there's still a Father's house in heaven that no one can destroy. It is eternal in heaven, our place in the presence of God. There is the Father's house in which we can rejoice in the blessing of God. The copy's been destroyed, but the true and living God, the true uh, Father's house is still there. Heaven is called paradise because of its beauty. Heaven is called a mansion because of its great home. Heaven is called a country because of its vast, um, uh, vast population and vastness. Uh, heaven is called a holy city because of its inhabitants. Heaven is called a kingdom because of its king. Heaven is called a home because of, that's where family will live. Family will dwell there. Isn't that beautiful? And so Jesus Christ said, let not your heart be troubled. Stop it. There's a God in heaven. Stop it. Don't feel helpless at the graveyard. There's a God in heaven. Stop it. Don't feel void in your life, feeling like your life doesn't matter or your life has not been fulfilled. Stop it. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Yes, he was invisible. And yes, now I'm invisible. But let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm going to disappear just like uh, the Father was invisible. I'm going to become the invisible King of kings and Lord of lords. I'm going to disappear. I'm going to be the invisible God. Amen. And he's telling his disciples, yeah, I'm going to disappear. Oh, I'll reappear when he rose again from the grave. The same body that was crucified rose again from the grave. The resurrected Son of God. But if you'll notice his body, Jesus appeared here and he appeared there and he appeared here and he appeared, appeared there and he was invisible here and then he was visible here and then he was invisible here till one day he went out on the, the hillside of, of uh, uh, the Mount of Olives and out on that hillside he looked at them after his resurrection 50 days after in Acts chapter 1 verse 10 and 11 and while he looked steadfast toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He disappeared in the clouds. But he said, I'll be back. He disappeared, went back to sit down at the Father's right hand. He said, when I get there, I'm going to send another, the Comforter, the Holy Ghost. And he was with you. Now he's going to be in you and he'll guide you into all truth. I'll be there the invisible God, the Spirit of God pulsating in the church and in our hearts, the invisible King of kings and Lord of lords. Woo! He said, preacher, you got Bible for that? Yeah. Paul told Timothy in chapter 1, verse 17, and this is not talking about God the Father. This is talking about Jesus. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, Invisible, the only wise God, be honoring glory forever and ever. Amen. So Jesus becomes invisible. The day he became invisible. And so Jesus Christ tells them, I'm going away. And Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. How can we come later on? And Jesus says, Thomas Listen to me. Come on. Come on. You can get this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Thomas goes, oh. I mean, that's how powerful and simple salvation is. Oh. Hello. That's how powerful trusting God is. Oh. You mean I don't have to sweat bullets? No, you don't. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in the invisible God? Then trust the invisible Christ. He walked the earth, cleansed the leper, he, uh, opened blinded eyes, uh, uh, walked on water, turned water into wine. He's an incredible God, but he did vanish. He went back to heaven. He became the invisible 
King of kings and Lord of lords and sent to us an invisible Holy Ghost to embed in our heart another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, to lead and guide us and teach us in the altars. Yes. Amen. Yes. Come on. Feel something. Hello. Feel something. You say, well, you can't feel the Holy Ghost. Really? Could you feel anger? I met a guy the other day that obviously he could feel his anger because I could feel it. And I got too close to him. I could feel the heat coming off him. So I just backed off. I mean, he was mad. He wasn't mad at me, but I didn't need to be in his ballpark because he was swinging a mighty bat. He was mad. The best thing to do when someone loses it and goes bazooka, just leave, go away, disappear, because you're, you're sticking your head into a head chopper when you get involved with it. Just back off. God can take care of that stuff. So Thomas says, how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is a beautiful scripture that I think all of us need to understand. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Isn't that beautiful? I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, you see the I am's in John. In the Gospel of John, there are, there are seven I am's. Some say eight, but seven I am's. In John 6, verse 35, Jesus Christ says, I am the bread of life. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus Christ says, I am the light of the world. In John 10, verse 7, Jesus Christ says, I am the door. In John 11, verse 25, Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. And then in our text verse, verse 6 of John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In chapter 15, he says, I am the true vine. Without me, you can do nothing. And then in chapter 7, I am the good shepherd that give the light, gives my life for the sheep. And so I want you to understand today that just as Jesus Christ disappeared on that Mount of Olive hillside and went back into the heavens and wrapped himself in a cloud and he disappeared, Jesus today is invisible. We're, we find in, in the scripture that um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, that he is the invisible God. Jesus is the invisible King of kings and Lord of lords. Let me show you another scripture. Um, Jesus did, you know, the disciples loved it to be walking with him. And who doesn't want to see something, right? But the disciples, they saw their Savior die on the cross. He was buried and he disappeared in the tomb. He came back, revealed himself, and proved that he was resurrected from the ground. And then he went gone again. Went into the heavens, disappeared. Right now, Jesus Christ is invisible to us. He is the invisible God. Jesus Christ sits down at the right hand of God the Father. He is the invisible God. He sent an invisible power called the Holy Ghost. He sent an invisible strength and comfort called the Holy Ghost. He sent an invisible power of blessing called the Holy Ghost. Comforter and the Spirit of God called the Holy Ghost. He sent that. It's here. The Holy, He's here. He's in this place. The Holy Ghost is here. But Jesus Christ himself has vanished. He's still there. He's sitting in heaven. He still sits at the Father's right hand. He's still in a resurrected body. He's coming back someday, the Son of Man, in the clouds of glory. And that same body that was crucified on the cross of Calvary, that was beaten, rejected, and, and bloodletted until he died, that same body that was put in the tomb and rose again from the grave, that same body is going to get up from the throne just any day now and step down to the clouds of heaven and call his church home. The Son of God. Hello. He's coming as the Son of Man. Then later, after the Great Tribulation, he's coming back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the King of the Son of David, the King that rules and reigns on the earth. Isn't that beautiful? Let me read two verses to you in John 20, verse 28 and 29. 
And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. This is where Jesus appeared to them and showed them his hands and his feet. And Thomas fell at the feet of Jesus Christ and said, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me. See, he had doubted that it was him. He said, I won't believe unless I see. And then when Jesus come, he said, thou hast, Because you've seen me, thou hast believed. But he says, Blessed are they. Everybody shout, I'm, I'm some of they. I'm them. I'm some of them. Get my English straight here. Blessed are they that have not seen, yet have believed. Now we're back to the same place where Jesus Christ said, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? He's invisible. Believe also in me. I'll be invisible. The day that Jesus is invisible, the day he became invisible, the day he visited, he says, we're going to come right back to that. You believe in God. Now he's invisible. He says, now, as you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. Jesus Christ has brought to us the assurity that one day he's coming back to take us home. And then he says, blessed are they that have not seen, yet they believe. And we are them. We are them. A special blessing to you and I that Jesus Christ says, stop that nervousness. Stop that unbelief. Stop that pain. Stop that. Be comforted because you believe in God. Believe also me. How many in this room right now would raise your hand and say, I believe in God? Come on, raise your hand. Say, I believe in God. Say it out loud. I believe in God. Then when you're worried, Jesus says, stop it. Believe in me. I made contact with you. I delivered you. I've forgiven you. Stop it. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to disappear. I'm going to be an invisible Jesus. I'm going to ascend to the Father. I'm going to prepare for you a place. And when I prepare for you that place, I'm going to come back visible. I'm going to come back visible and and lift you up and, and bring you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's a great verse. How many would agree that's a great verse? Now, let me point out something. We're going to wrap this sermon up. When Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross of Calvary and he was put in a tomb, you could see his dead body when he was crucified. I mean, he didn't resemble a man. He was so mutilated. The blood had been shed. He had been crucified. But you could see a dead body. But Jesus wasn't there. Just his body. Just the son of man. Just the body was there. They put Jesus in the tomb. And now he's an invisible Messiah. You ready to get blessed? How many of you ever had, and I know you have because this is kind of a no-brainer question. How many, how many ever had a loved one die? They're invisible right now. They've gone away. They still exist, but they're, they're invisible. They've gone away. Does that mean they're gone away forever? No, it means they're gone away like Jesus gone away. And Jesus will bring them back with him when he comes. Isn't that beautiful? Someone says, well, what about cremation? You know, you cremate somebody. And well, let's look at it like this. It takes about 40, 45 years for you to return to ashes. If you put in a box about 40 to 45 years, you're, you're going to disintegrate into ashes. Cremation takes about 40 minutes. 45 minutes, you're condensed down to ashes, but it's the same substance either way. One took 40 minutes, the other one takes 40 years. The end result is ashes. The end result is invisible. The end result is not here with us. The end result is they have become invisible. But that doesn't mean they're not still alive. That doesn't mean they're not still 
here. That doesn't mean they're not still uh, with Christ. That doesn't mean they will not resurface. Cremation, is, it, cre there's nothing wrong with cremation. Nothing wrong. People ask me all the time, do you think it's wrong to be cre cremated? And I said, only if you're still breathing. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with being cremated if that's what you want to do. But, you know, we, we have to also understand that King Saul was cremated. The first king of Israel was cremated. I just thought I'd throw that out for you. But there's nothing wrong with cremation. The end result is one takes 40 to 45 minutes to make you ashes. The other one takes 40 to 45 years, slowly melting away. Either way, you're going to be ashes. Either way, you're going to be invisible. I've got loved ones that have died. And I'll tell you right now, they're invisible. They're gone. I can't see them, but that doesn't mean they're not there. Now, I don't mean ghosts. You know, blue at night. That's not what I'm talking about. If you're seeing ghosts in your house, ooh, you're seeing demons. Hello. I said you're seeing demons or grandbabies one. I don't know which, but anyway. You say you're behaving yourself. I'm not trying to behave myself. I'm preaching. But when Jesus Christ said, let not your heart be troubled. You know why that scripture is so powerful? Because he's saying, you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He did prepare a place for us at the cross of Calvary. He prepared a mercy seat for us. He prepared forgiveness for us. He prepared a place of joy, unspeakable and full of glory. He prepared a place for us in the house of the Lord. He prepared a place for us in the family of God. But he also is preparing a place that's tangible, the Father's house, tangible. There's a mansion in glory that God is making for us. Amen. There's preachers, they wax eloquent. Hey, you better serve the Lord. You better work hard, drive hard. Send up a two before so you can have a good mansion. Send up some material up into heaven so you'll have a big mansion because if you don't get your act together, you're going to find yourself 40 acres on, on the other side of heaven down in a deep ravine, uh, 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 just a, a put together uh, uh, old shack that looks like it's put together out of toothpicks and, and just old run down place because that's all you sent to heaven to for your mansion. That's where you, nonsense. It's a mansion. Amen. It's a mansion. The, the truth is when we get in that mansion, we're going to shout, Unworthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. There is a tangible, literal heaven. There is a tangible, literal Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, sitting at the right hand of God the Father. There is a tangible, literal, resurrected body when Jesus Christ returns. We're not going to float around in the heavens in flower sacks playing a harp and spending the rest of our life as fat little naked babies in the clouds. nor skinny-necked babies. I heard people, I, you know, it, it's just all I can do to keep from biting my tongue. In fact, I have to every now and then. Well, brother so-and-so got his wings today. No, he didn't. He's got dead armpits. He didn't get his wings today. When you die to go be with Jesus, you're not going to be an angel. You weren't an angel here. You won't be one there. If you die, you don't sprout wings. Well, he got his wings today. What was that movie? It's a great, it's a wonderful life. Remember that? What was the angel's name? Uh, Clarence. Yeah, we got one spiritual person in this auditorium. Clarence was the angel that was sent back because he didn't have wings. And every time a bell rung, an angel gets his wings. Don't work that way. That don't work that way. 
In fact, I think the devil, if he had wings, had them clipped a long time ago. Amen? So when someone dies, you, you know, someone says, well, you know, they're angels now. They, they got their wings. No, they didn't. They either went to heaven or hell. They're either in the presence of God or they're not. They're either redeemed or they're not. They're, they're, and, and, and they're not going to be on the thoroughfare uh, of a great, wonderful, Holy Ghost golf course in the sky. No, no. Everybody knows that golf's too boring to be anything in heaven. Now, we got goofers in here, and you're thinking, preacher, that's just unnecessary. You're right, it's unnecessary. But, you know, you hear people talk all the time about, well, he's fishing in the river of life. Well, they're over there playing bingo down there at the other corner. After all, they were Catholics. <laughs> Come on. Oh. oh, they're down there knitting. You know, Sister Bertha's down there knitting. Great heaven, knitting room in the sky. Nonsense. Nonsense. You don't find in Revelation 20, 21, and 22, there's a great sewing room in the sky. You don't find, you do find a river of life, but the best I can tell about this river of life, it is encased in transparent gold, and the river of life flows to the holy city all the way from the top, from God's throne down to the end, and it spills out on planet Earth several hundred feet or maybe miles above the earth. The water flows on the earth, a river of life, but encased in that river of life, on either side is the tree of life, and they're encased in that. They can look through the city and see that river of life flowing through the holy city. That's nothing, you know, well, we'll go down to the river of life and, and gig a few glorified fish. Well, that might be heaven for you, but that's not heaven for them fish. Amen? <laughs> Hello? And some of you are such bad fishermen, it might be heaven for me while I'm catching fish, but you can't catch a thing. It wouldn't be heaven for you. Let's just get something straight. When someone disappears, they go to heaven or hell. When they disappear, they die, they go to heaven or hell. You don't see them, but they are someplace. And we can trust God and let not our hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'd go to prepare a place for you. So Jesus is preparing a place for us. And when he returns, we're going to be resurrected, those that sleep in Jesus, and we which are alive and remaining, will be caught up to meet the clouds in the air, and we're going to look so much like Jesus. There's hope for some of you. There's hope for me. Amen. You know, you can get in front of the mirror and say, I'm going to put on this stuff so I look better when I go out in public. Listen, God's going to descend. Jesus is going to descend from heaven. We're going to be caught up to meet Jesus in the air, and God's going to put Jesus on you so you'll look good enough to go into heaven. Amen? There won't be no uglies in heaven. They'll all be beautiful. Right? Say, so, preacher, you've done made me mad. I tried to. I'm trying, to get you, I'm trying to get you to think about what I'm saying. Just don't get so off-keyed. I meet, I meet people that you wonder how they even make it through the day. I, I mean, I've met people that are, they are so spiritual. Spiritual. They're Tinkerbells. Tinkerbell spiritual. Every, ooh, and you wonder how they even get up in the morning. You wonder if they just roll out of bed and float to the ceiling and stick to the ceiling. Let's get real. Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, a real cross, a real death, a real suffering, a real sacrifice. He died a real death. He was put in a real tomb. He rose again in a real body. He's the eternal 
pre-existing, eternal God. And even though he's invisible today, he sent the Holy Ghost to help us and to guide us through. And so he's saying to us, one day we'll go to be with Jesus and we're going to go to a real mansion. A real place prepared for us in heaven. Isn't that good? Hello? So tonight, I hope you got something out of this. I hope you've seen this, uh, let not your heart be troubled, different. You know, we, we hear it preached many times, but I hope you've seen that Jesus is trying to say to them, I'm going to be invisible like the God you believe in, I, you know, because I am God. And Jesus, I'm going to be invisible. I'm going to be gone. And let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, just as God is invisible. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many men. I'm going to go to the invisible God, my invisible Father. And when I go to my invisible Father, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back. And I'm going to... I'm going to come visibly to earth, and I'm going to call you up, and I'm going to take those that have disappeared, sleeping in Jesus, I'm going to raise them again from the grave, and they're going to be literally materialized before our eyes, because God has promised us a literal heaven. Amen. Amen. Stand with me. I mean, we'd agree this is a famous verse. This is a famous verse. Let not your heart be troubled. Stop it. You worry all night, stop it. Don't ever walk away from a hopeless situation and feel like you're abandoned because you're not. You believe in God. Believe also in me, Jesus Christ said. We can trust Jesus. We can trust Jesus. Blessed, blessed are they that have not seen, yet they believe. I'm one of them. And I trust you're one of them. Amen? Josh going to play and sing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.